are so glad that you're here this morning. I know that we're coming from all different weeks and um, I just want you to feel free to bring all of that into worship this morning. A couple announcements for you. Um, this is a communion Sunday. We're gonna be celebrating communion each week during the course of Lent. And so if you haven't had a chance to grab your communion elements, um, make sure you do that sometime before the end of the service. Um, I'll be honest, this morning, the Moorlang Jackson household is using a KFC uh, roll for our communion bread because it was the only bread we had in the house. And that will work just fine. The Lord can redeem anything. That is true. Um, I'm going to light a candle now. Something that we have made part of our times together during this season, especially when we can't physically be together. I find it particularly important to have um, physical reminders that the Lord is with us, even in this crazy, unusual way of worshiping. God is here. God is working. God is deeply in love with us. We wanted to make sure that you all knew, um, I think you know that we have three new elders that have rotated onto council. And one of the first things we do um, as our new elders arrive is identify who is gonna be um, functioning in the different roles. And so we just wanted to let you know um, that for this coming year, Mary Vincent is our new council president. Um, James Stevens is our new clerk and Alex Mitchell is our treasurer. And so, um, as things arise for you that you need to be in touch with council, those are three folks that um, you may be getting in touch with and they are there for you. The last thing we wanted to let you know, um, PATH Preschool, the preschool that Sanctuary runs is currently enrolling for next year. And our hope and plan is to be in person in the fall. Um, and we just wanted to ask you, if you know folks um, with kids in that preschool range, uh, if you would be willing to just share about PATH and um, direct them to our website to learn a little bit more. Gwen or I are, are always happy to, to chat with folks um, to answer questions about the preschool, but because of the pandemic, our enrollment is down quite a bit this year, and we know it's gonna take some time to build back up from that, and we just thought it would be great if we could have your help um, in spreading the word about our preschool. So thanks for thinking about that. I think that's all that I wanted to make sure to share with you announcement wise. So welcome to worship. We hope that you um, feel the Lord's presence with you this morning. Let's continue to worship the Lord. Detroit for the second Sunday of Lent is called Reminiscere, Latin for Remember. You may recognize verses of the antiphon. They are reminiscent of Psalm 25. Remember, O Lord, thy bowels of compassion and thy mercies that are from the beginning of the world. Neither let my enemies laugh at me, for none of them that wait on thee shall be confounded. Deliver Israel, O God, from all his tribulations. To thee, O Lord, have I lifted up my soul. In thee, O my God, I put my trust. Let me not be ashamed. On the second Sunday of Lent, let us take a few moments to consider the seasons in our lives marked by God's faithfulness, the depths of his compassion, or seasons marked by God's mercy.
on a note card or in your Bible near Psalm 25. Write these memories. Return to them when you need to be reminded that God keeps his promises. Return to them when all hope seems lost. Return to them when you seek mercy. As we enter into worship, let's speak the final words of the intro together in unity. To thee, O Lord, have I lifted up my soul. In thee, O my God, I put my trust. Let me not be ashamed. From the Jesus Storybook Bible. Son of Laughter. Years passed, and things didn't get any better. People were still just as cruel and mean to one another. They still got sick and died. God's world was still full of tears. It was never meant to be like this. But God was getting ready to do something about it. He was going to make all the wrong things right, and he was going to do it through a family. Abraham, God said, how many stars are there? God was about to tell his friend a wonderful secret. Hmm, let me see, Abraham said, rolling up his sleeves. But have you ever tried counting stars? <laughs> then you know how hard it is. 993, 994, 997, uh uh-oh, no, wait. One, two, (laughs) of course he kept losing count. Too many, he said. Guess what, God laughed. I will give you so many children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren, you won't be able to count them either. Abraham couldn't help giggling at such a wonderful idea. But he stopped himself. How could he have a family? Don't be silly. He didn't have any children, let alone grandchildren. He wiped away a tear. Anyway, it was far too late for him to start having babies at his age. He was 99 years old. What could God mean? Abraham, God said, believe me. And then God told Abraham his secret rescue plan. Abraham, I will make your family very big, God promised, until one day your family will come to number more than even all the stars in the sky. Abraham looked up at the dark night sky, thick with stars. You will be my special family, my people, and through you, everyone on earth will be blessed. It was an incredible promise. God was going to rescue the world through Abraham's family. One of his great, great, great grandchildren would be the child, the promised one, the rescuer. But it's too wonderful, Abraham said. How can it be true? Is anything too good to be true? God asked. Is anything too wonderful for me? So Abraham trusted what God said more than what his eyes could see, and he believed. Now when Abraham's wife Sarah heard God's promise, she just laughed to herself. But it wasn't a happy laugh. It had tears in it. She'd always wanted a baby, Could her dream come true? Could she really have a baby when she was 90 years old? No, of course not. Don't be silly. It was far too late. Sarah didn't believe God could do what he promised. 
She had forgotten that when God says something, it's as good as done. Of course, it was as easy for God to give her a baby son as it was for him to make all the stars in the sky. Sure enough, nine months later, just as God had promised, Sarah gave birth to a baby boy. They named him Isaac, which means son of laughter. And Sarah laughed. But this time, it was a glorious, happy laugh. Her dream had come true. God would do as he promised. He would always look after Abraham's family, his special people. And one day, God would send another baby, a baby promised to a girl who didn't even have a husband. But this baby would bring laughter to the whole world. This baby would be everyone's dream come true. To be continued. Good morning, friends. I think it's delightful to see more signs of advancing spring almost every day. Would you please join me in thanking God for spring 
and for asking him to bring peace and healing to our world. Let's pray. Father God, it is a delight to see more signs of spring almost every day. Crocus in bloom, daffodils too, and the buds on trees are beginning to swell and turn green. Thank you. Thank you for the signs of new life. Thank you for the new life we have in your son, Jesus. But Father, as joyous as this all is, these are hard and difficult times too. The pandemic still claims lives here and around the world, and people are still getting sick. Father, we pray for healing. We pray you would continue to give medical professionals better treatments for the sick. We thank you for the vaccines. We ask for an abundant supply of them. We pray that people will accept vaccination. We pray that vaccine distribution will be efficient, effective, and above all, equitable. We pray that those most in need, those most vulnerable to this virus, would get vaccinations first. The pandemic has also revealed fracture lines in your body, the church, Lord. I pray your spirit would heal those fractures, not with uniformity, but with unity, with love. To that end, Father, I would pray for this church and all churches, the prayer Paul prayed for the Philippian church. I pray that your love may overflow more and more with knowledge and full insight to help you to determine what is best so that in the day of Christ you may be pure and blameless, having produced the harvest of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ for the glory and praise of God. Thank you, Father, for Paul's words. Thank you for all the good things you are doing and will continue to do in our midst. The glory belongs to you. Amen. Now, please join me in the prayer Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
Well, hi, friends. We're going to try a little something different than what we've been doing. I think, there we go. Um, yeah, uh, we have, uh, we've done this just a couple of times before, but uh, uh, we thought we'd uh, try a little live sermon this morning. We are coming up on, uh, on one year of meeting like this, which is just crazy to me. <laughs> um, uh, it was, I've, I have been reflecting a little bit as, as the weather's getting nicer and it's getting towards spring, um, it's starting to feel familiar, like, a, oh yeah, we've, we've done a spring like this before last year. And, uh, uh, and so I just was reflecting on the, it was the second Sunday of March. So I think we're not quite at that one year mark where we first um, canceled in-person worship at Taproot and, and met um, I don't even know if we did Zoom at that point. We did something else, but um, I, I wanted to, to just give you a quick update too. We, we are beginning the, to work towards um, returning to in-person worship, and uh, there, we, we don't have a, a hard fixed date on that yet. There are still um, a number of things to be figured out. We're, I think most of you are aware we're in conversation with United, where our church office is and where the uh, PATH preschool meets. Um, to to talk about kind of how best we can um, meet together in that space, um, two churches using the same building, they're in a similar spot as we are in terms of they've been meeting for about a year on uh, on Zoom or Google Chat or whatever they're using and trying to figure out how best to do this in a safe way and um, we need to update the equipment that we're using in order to allow for live streaming and in-person worship at the same time. So there's a few things to be done. We have uh, we have some checklists that we're working through, but I wanted to let you all know that we are kind of moving um, slowly and faithfully in that direction. And we recognize, too, that one of the um, uh, challenges, but also the opportunities for grace that we have as a church um, is in how we uh, approach each other with the varying views on returning to in-person. Some of you uh, are wanting us to be there yesterday, <laughs> and that's okay. Uh, some of you are, are not quite sure, and you're not sure maybe how long it will uh, be before you feel comfortable being back in person, and that's okay too. Um, and I think this is an opportunity for us to view each other with grace, uh, trusting, assuming the best about each other, that we all want to be back in person, and we all want to do it safely. So that's all that I want to say about that right now. Um, I, I want to use, we, we're working through this checklist of kind of what are the next steps for this. And that's that's my um, not so subtle segue to the sermon this morning, in that we all relate to checklists in uh, a variety of ways. Uh, some of you love checklists. Some of you live by them and love them greatly. Others of you maybe feel more oppressed by them. I find myself in a, in a bit of a mixed spot there when it comes to checklists. Uh, I do, I have had the experience of reaching the end of my day and uh, being able to look back and see quite a few things that I've checked off of a checklist, a checklist and feel like oh, that's, that's been a good day, right? That's the sign that today's been a good day is I got a lot of things done and I checked them off the checklist. There are other times where I reach the end of the day and um, my checklist uh, is either the same as it was at the beginning of the day or it has grown. Uh, and it's even bigger. And those are the days when I do not enjoy the checklist. And um, yeah, so I, I am confident that uh, even in this, this mix of people here that we have a variety of ways that we think about, think about checklists and approach them. Uh, I think that we are very susceptible as humans to approach our faith through uh, the, the, the lens of a checklist, that we are very susceptible to thinking about how we ourselves are doing in our faith in Christ, and also how others are doing in their faith in Christ uh, with the mindset of a checklist. We go through a checklist. So I want you to keep that, uh, that image in mind of a checklist as I read from Mark chapter 7, starting in verse 14, Mark 7, verse 14. Again, Jesus called the crowd to him and he said, listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside a person can defile them by going into them. Rather, it is what comes out of a person that defiles them. 
After he had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about this parable. Are you so dull, he asked? Don't you see that nothing that enters a person from the outside can defile them? For it doesn't go into their heart, but into their stomach, and then out of the body. Now in saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. He went on, what comes out of a person is what defiles them. For it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. Lord, thank you for your word this morning. This is both a, a beautiful word and a hard word for us, but we ask that your spirit would be our teacher. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. All right, so there is a, there is a context here. Jesus uh, says this after one of his many confrontations with the Pharisees. And I'll try and summarize the first part of chapter seven quickly here. Uh, the disciples are eating wheat from a field and they have not done what was expected of them, which was that they would do a ceremonial hand washing. Uh, I'm sure it had some practical hygiene uh, benefits as well, but the primary concern that the Pharisees raised with Jesus is this ceremonial, this ritual purity uh, piece to things that they wonder why the disciples aren't doing this, and they because it makes them question the disciples that they're that they're not very good Jews. They're not they're not doing the things that good faithful Jews are supposed to do. And Jesus then highlights how hypocritical the Pharisees are in this, um, and how focused on external markers, right, on that checklist they are. That that's how the Pharisees measure faith. There's this whole human tradition, this oral tradition that had developed around the law that the Pharisees um, made much of uh, for themselves and also for others. So for example, um, you know, we've just gone through the book of Exodus where Moses receives the law and in the law is, um, you know, keep the Sabbath, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Well, that is not specific enough. How do you know if you've kept the Sabbath? How do you know if you're being faithful to God by keeping the Sabbath? Um, how many steps can you walk, right? What can you lift? Uh, how many stairs can you go up and down? What constitutes work? And so there's this massive tradition that develops around the very specific ways in which um, one was supposed to keep the Sabbath and in which the very specific ways that one was supposed to exercise their faith. And um, and so you see a lot of conflict in the Gospels between Jesus and the Pharisees, in particular around the Sabbath, but around many of these laws, where Jesus is highlighting that you have, you have completely twisted the heart of this law um, and made it about a, check, a checklist. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, it's funny, we're, I think some of, the, some of the stuff to our ears that the Pharisees are concerned about strikes us as really weird. Like we just, we don't get it. We're like, why would you be so concerned about all these, the number of steps you can take on the Sabbath or the ceremonial washing of hands? Like those are not our concerns. But I do think that we are like the Pharisees or at least have a propensity towards to be like them in how we approach our faith through this checklist. Um, and, and I think it's also one of the ways in which we judge other people. Are they measuring up to our checklist of uh, what a faithful Christian looks like? How do we know who's in and who's out? And who are our people, right? Who are the people that kind of speak about things in the same way, use the same words that we use? That, that sometimes can be part of our checklist too, that, that the right words are getting used as people speak about the faith. But what we see here uh, in, in Jesus' interaction and in his teaching of the disciples is something that is consistent throughout scripture, which is this principle, that God does not look on the external, outside, appearances of man, of humans, uh, but God looks at the heart. God sees the heart. And I think that Jesus simultaneously makes it easier and harder to follow him in this passage. He makes it easier in that he widens the entry gate. Uh, one of the great 
concerns of the early church was you had people from a Jewish background who were coming to faith in Christ and becoming part of the early church, and you had people from a Greek and a Roman and a Gentile, which just means nations, just means non-Jews. All these people were coming together to try to form one church united in Christ, and it was hard. And uh, Paul's letters, of course, are filled with Paul's instructions to the early church about how hard but how necessary this work is. And so Jesus here, uh, he, he's saying that there is not a hurdle that you have to jump over in order to follow me based on keeping these Jewish ritual purity laws. You can eat unkosher hot dogs and still be faithful to Jesus. That's good news. So Jesus opens wide or uh, the, the doors to any who would come and follow him. Um, there's one less barrier. You don't have to get stuff in order first in order to follow Jesus. It doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter what your nationality, your ethnicity, anything. You are invited to come and follow Jesus. But he also makes it harder in that he makes it an issue of the heart. He says it's not about this, this checklist. It's about the heart. And I think that that's actually a more challenging invitation to be a people who are people of the heart, who are living from our heart in our faith. Because here's the thing. I think that we, we love the checklist. We really like that checklist uh, because it makes things a lot easier. It makes things crystal clear. Like, have I been faithful? Have I done what a good Christian is supposed to do? Um, when you're talking about the heart, matters of the heart, that's a lot harder to measure, both in ourselves and in others. There's a lot more gray there. I, uh, you know, I was thinking of, of ways in which this has been true in my own life. I think of, uh, you know, I grew up very much with this ideal kind of morning quiet time as the litmus test of my, of my faith, that if I read the Bible for 10 minutes and journaled or prayed for another 10 or 20 minutes, uh, and if I could check that box off in the morning, that was like, I was a good Christian. I, I, I was a faithful follower of Jesus if I had done that. And, um, and I wrestled with that. And I, I had my mornings of success that were great. Uh, and I had plenty of mornings of failure. And I, I recognized somewhere in college that that was a poor measure of my faith. And the irony, uh, what I found as I sort of gave up that as a measure of my faith, is that my desire, my hunger for God's word actually grew once I gave that up as a measure, as a checkbox. I found like, okay, I, I don't think that Jesus judges me based on did I have that successful quiet time or not. Um, but then as I, as I kind of gave that up as that marker, I found that my hunger for knowing more about Christ and, and, and communing with him through scripture and prayer uh, grew as a desire in my heart. Uh, a couple of other examples that came to my mind. Um, I, I grew up at a church where I think we were in the middle of purity culture. And when I say purity culture, I think some of you probably know what I'm talking about or have some sense. Some of you might be confused or, or wondering what that is. I, it's it's this culture that sort of uh, grew up in, I think, evangelical Christianity in the 80s and 90s, which was definitely when I was in youth group, that put a, a huge amount of emphasis on, um, on sexual purity, and in particular, you know, saving sex until marriage. Now, I want to say this. Um, saving sex until marriage is a wonderful idea. There's tons of wisdom in that. It's biblically based. Like, this is a good thing to reserve sex for the covenant lifelong bond of marriage. Um, that is a beautiful and a good thing. But when it becomes the checkbox litmus test of your faith, it becomes dangerous. And it becomes a, a place of judgment and shame and, and a place where God's grace is excluded if you've messed up in that area. You know, if, if, that, if you're not, if you can't check that box, you know, does God still love you? Yes, let me just say that unequivocally. Yes, God still loves you. So this is something that uh, became, it's a good thing in and of itself. The same thing with, uh, with quiet time, with uh, morning devotionals. These are good, good things. Um, 
that when we make them the checkbox of our faith, uh, it really twists the, the heart of the gospel and the good news. The, the final example that came to my mind is, is tithing. When I say the word tithing, if you've grown up in the church, you probably hear the number 10%, uh, which is biblically based. This is an Old Testament uh, law um, of what God required people to give. Matt Kamink's uh, sermon on the offering a couple of weeks ago is a great reference point if you want to dive deeper into the offering and the purpose of the offering. But this 10% number, uh, it's not random. It is definitely based in the Bible. But when that 10% number becomes, again, the checkbox, the litmus test of, okay, we've been faithful to God with our money because we've given away 10% of what we have. Um, and then we assume that the other 90% is ours, right? That it's ours to do with what we want. This is a twisting of, of something that is good, a good biblical principle, but when it becomes that checkbox, um, it, it gets twisted and, uh, and we lose the heart of our faith. We lose our heart. And um, there's a sermon coming in a couple of weeks, I think Summer's preaching on it, where we will see who Jesus lifts up as the ultimate example of someone who is in a right relationship with their money. And 10% doesn't have anything to do with it. We'll just say that. So those are ways in which uh, I think we are susceptible to having these good things, good practices, good spiritual practices becoming the ultimate checkbox for our faith. And Jesus says, it's not about those things. It's about the heart. Uh, there's, there's a flow here. Maybe, maybe that's one way to think of it. There's a direction in which we live. And we live from the heart out or from the inside out. In the kingdom of God, that's the, that's the flow of life. But the bummer is that Jesus does not give a very rosy assessment of our hearts in this passage. Uh, this passage ends on a downer. I don't know if you caught that, but his list of the things that can come out of a person's heart, which are the things that defile them, not the stuff that they put in, uh, but the things that come out is a awful list of awful things that come out of the human heart. Um, attitudes and actions, um, yeah, that are not very inspiring. And if that's where we end, uh, I think we're pretty discouraged because if we can't rely on um, human tradition and on spiritual practices to save us, and if we can't rely on our own hearts, um, well, what are we left with? We know that this is not the end of the story, the, uh, this assessment of our hearts. We know that uh, there is an invitation here that Jesus makes in the gospel for a heart transplant for a new heart, for a heart that becomes a fountain of life rather than a poisoned well, right? That image of, of springs of living water pouring out of our lives into the lives of the people around us is a picture of a transformed heart that Jesus offers us. And so in as much as there is a, a direction here that we live from the, from the inside out, from the heart out, there's another direction, which is Christ feeding his life into us, transforming our hearts. And that in Christ, it is possible to have this new heart. And so to, to, to wrap up here, I think there's an invitation that I, that I sense as, as I have found myself reflecting on this to sort of think about what are the, what are those practices? What are those check boxes that you equate with your faith? And more often than not, I think these are probably good things in your life. These are tithing, um, sexual purity, and devotionals, the three that I mentioned earlier. These are all good things that when they become the ultimate thing, they, they can become an idol in that way, or they become this um, human tradition that is, becomes a checkbox. So what are the ones that you are susceptible to? Um, both for yourself and for others in the way that you view others and their faithfulness. Um, perhaps it's the way that people um, speak about 
uh, about justice or service, I mean, there, some of it's a language thing, right? We're looking for certain words that people say. And if they say those words, then we know they're a certain kind of Christian that is like our kind of Christian. And if they don't, then we're not so sure, you know? So maybe reflect a little on, on what are those for you? Those external factors, external the external pieces to your faith, and then what? How is it then that we recenter our hearts in Christ? And the irony, of course, is that one of the ways is through some of these practices. Um, we just get the order wrong, and so maybe there are some new spiritual practices, some some con contemplative prayer, some some ways of reading Scripture where you're not reading it just to check that box, but you're reading it for. Uh, to discover more of who Christ is and who you are in Christ. Maybe there's some old familiar spiritual practices that you need to sort of pause and approach with a new intention, a new, a new meaning so that they don't grow stale. And maybe it's simply a, a prayer. Um, there's this prayer, we, we, we've prayed this as a church before, uh, that Thomas Merton wrote that I love. And I think one of the reasons I love it is that it is a, a prayer from the posture of humility about the things that I am doing and not really knowing and being certain that they are born out of love or out of a purity of heart, um, but acknowledging that before God and saying, Lord, I, I want to do these things, not out of a checklist, not out of, not out of checking a box, but I want to do them because uh, you have put your love in my heart, but I don't know my own motives. I am, I don't know if that's true, but I want it to be true. So this is the prayer that I want to, to wrap up our time together as we think about these questions that Jesus raises for us in Mark 7. So if you would pray with me. My Lord God, I have no idea where I'm going. I do not see the road ahead of me. And I cannot know for certain where it will end. Nor do I really know myself. And the fact that I think I'm following your will does not mean that I am actually doing so. But I do believe that the desire to please you does in fact please you. And I hope that I have that desire in all that I'm doing. I hope that I will never do anything apart from that desire. And I know that if I do this, you will lead me by the right road, though I may know nothing about it. Therefore, I will trust you always, though I may seem to be lost and in the shadow of death. I will not fear, for you are ever with me. And you will never leave me to face my perils alone. All of this we pray in the strong name of our Savior. Amen.
Well, folks, we are going to come to the table now. And so if you have those communion elements, go ahead and grab those. One of the things that we uh, often do as we come to the table is just to give us a little bit of space to prepare our hearts. Um, I, I, I wish there were, again, this is, uh, reflects my own propensity to want a checklist and want, we want these external things. I wish there was a five point step-by-step -step process I could give you towards putting Christ's love in your heart. Uh, and there are many things that open us up to that. And I think that this is one of those, approaching the table with humility, confessing our need, confessing our sin, and asking that, you know, as we take in these elements, that something of the life of Christ and the love of Christ would fill our hearts so that as we live our days, as we go about our work, as we go about our relationships, loving our neighbors, um, it would be this overflow of the love of Christ that has been put into us, that there would be this dual directional river, the river of, of Christ's love pouring into our lives, um, filling us up to overflowing out into the world. So uh, let's take just a, a, a little moment here of silence as we come to the table. Lord, we are confident that nothing can separate us from your love. And yet we are aware and confess to you all the times in which we turn away, all the times in which we externalize something that is meant to be an internal reality that just overflows into the lives of those around us. Forgive us, Lord. May we be people of grace, people of mercy, and people filled with your love. Lord, remind us and fill us as we take this bread and drink this cup. Thank you for this great demonstration and reminder of your love for us. Amen. Amen. Friends, on the night that our Lord was betrayed, he took bread, and after having given thanks, he broke it. He said, this is my body. It's broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, and he said, this cup, it's the cup of the new covenant. It's my blood poured out for the forgiveness of your sins. As often as you drink it, you proclaim the Lord's saving death and resurrection until he comes again to make all things new. This is not sanctuary's table. It's not even the Moorlang's table. It's the Lord's table. And all who know their need for a savior and put their trust in him are welcome to partake in these gifts of God for God's people. Enjoy. Summer, this is Christ's body broken for you and his blood shed for you. Well, Christ's body and blood poured out for you because he loves you. wanted to mention two things to you as we are ending. The first one we forgot to mention earlier during announcements, we are still looking for someone to replace Sarah Lewis Ossink as our safe church representative. This person is simply um, someone who is available for folks to reach out if they have concerns about anything that happens in the life of our community. And really this person is just one who, who helps us be intentional about making sure that all of the various spaces and places that we exist as a church are um, welcoming, hospitable, and safe places. So if this is something that is um, that you feel like you resonate with, would love to hear from you and talk to you more about what that could look like. The other thing that I wanted to mention, just following Mark's talk, if you found yourself um, being gripped by what he was saying and desiring um, to do some work on your heart and your relationship with the Lord, I just wanted to um, let you know that I'm a trained spiritual director um, and would love to talk with you about what it would look like to, to be in spiritual direction with you. I meet with several of you once a month just to kind of 
provide a space for you to work on your relationship with the Lord. Um, and so if that is intriguing to you, just wanted to um, let you know that I would love to talk with you about what that could look like. And if summer's schedule is full, I am an untrained spiritual director and would also enjoy doing that. <laughs> is that fair to say? AKA pastor. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> uh, let, me, let me wrap this up by reading from a, another passage, but a familiar one that I think captures well um, this sense of, uh, of our hearts, living our faith out of our hearts rather than external measures. When we hear 1 Corinthians 13, this great chapter on love, um, one of the things that I've, I've kind of grown in my awareness of is that the things that Paul is talking about here are all really good things that if they are done without love are empty and void. They're meaningless checkboxes. And so just wanna read the first part of this chapter um, as another angle of approaching um, this faith that is lived out of hearts full of love. Yet I will show you a most excellent way, Paul says. If I speak in the tongues of men or angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clinging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship, that I may boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered and it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hope, always perseveres. Love never fails. Friends, go with this promise this week in the love of God the Father, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship and power of the Holy Spirit. And the church, though they were muted, said, Amen. <laughs> you can unmute and say it if you want to. That would be great. I can stop doing it. Amen. 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 There we go. I hear some of that. <laughs>